So we were in the. <laughs> And Okay, let me just remind you where we were. Uh, <clears throat> we had the, the most general Lagrangian for cattle kind of superfields. Could be, we, I told you that it can be written as an arbitrary real function k of phi diagram phi. And uh, uh, the d term of that, that will get transformed as a total derivative. And w of phi, which is a, a holomorphic function of phi. Uh, the f term of it transforms as a, as a total derivative. This is called the superpotential, and this is called the Keller potential. And uh, those are the basic quantities in the effective n equals 1 supersymmetric super actions. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, I, I, I mentioned the, the, what is the Wesomino model, and that had, in that case, we had one Keller superfield, which was a, uh, we, we asked for a renormalizable k, and so in that case, k was a phi dagger phi, and w was a was cubic in phi, and uh, and for that we found that uh, once we write this in components, then uh, um, we got some. Very nice because we got essentially the standard Lagrangians for uh, the scalar field and a uh, fermion field. <coughs> that uh, let me just uh, write for you. <coughs> So uh, we found that uh, L was uh, d mu phi star d mu phi plus uh, uh, minus a half, I'm sorry, plus i psi bar sigma bar mu d mu psi minus a half d to w d phi square Psi psi. <coughs> Let's conjugate. Minus the potential of phi and phi star, where the potential was equal to the terms f star f, where f were the auxiliary fields. This Lagrangian is when I eliminated already the auxiliary fields by their field equations, and that was all equal to dw by d phi square. And uh, so that's what, where we finished last time. So let me make some remarks related to, to this. <coughs> oh, I forgot to erase the rest of the some remarks. First is the, uh, this Lagrangian L with n equals to 1 supersymmetry is a particular case of uh, a standard non supersymmetric Lagrangian. Okay. 
Okay. So we can see that the several points. One is that, as I told you, the scalar potential is positive definite. It's positive semi-definite. So in that sense, it's, it's a particular case. So you, you don't have any scalar potential, but the scalar potential is, is given by this expression, and it's semi-positive definite. <coughs> Second, <coughs> if you look at, uh, at the term here, d2w d phi square, remember that w, what's the term? m phi square plus, uh, say, g phi cube. So the d2w d phi square will pick, in particular, this term. And that will be a mass term m times psi psi. So the mass for the field psi, which is m, equals when you compute the same thing, this uh, dw d phi square in the scalar potential, they will this will give you the quadratic term for the scalar field phi. So this will have, of course, we have to go through the minimization and so on. But in general terms, you can see that the, the coefficient of the quadratic term is also m. So this will be equal to the mass of the scalar field phi. You see, the, scalar, the mass of the fermion is equal to the mass of the scalar. We will be more careful in regarding this uh, scalar potential in, uh, uh, in the next two lectures, because we have to go through the process of minimization. So, but you can uh, immediately see that this coefficient is a mass term. Uh, also, the Yukawa coupling Yukawa coupling is the term proportional to phi psi psi. Again, because of this term, you have the second derivative that will pick up, uh, will pick uh, that, uh, uh, this coefficient, g times phi. The second derivative will give you a g times phi. So you have a g phi psi psi. So the coefficient of the Yukawa coupling, this is the coefficient of this, equals to g. Um, but, but g is also the scalar self-coupling. In the sense that g multiply the phi cube. When I take dw d phi, that will give me a g phi square. When I square it, that will give me a g square phi to the 4. OK, so that means that the coupling of the scalar to itself is given by g, which is the same g that multiplies phi psi psi. Okay. So I will put here g phi psi psi and the other one g squared. So it's the same g. That's the important thing is that this g and this g are the same. This, uh, this little thing here, uh, if you don't like it, I take it out. OK. So we, are, we, try to we try to satisfy the customers here. <laughs> now, uh, the thing is that the coupling is proportional to g squared. Uh, there may be a factor of 1 half or something, depending on, 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 the, on, on, the, uh, on the derivative. So I'm sorry, there's a factor of uh, 3 or so. But it's essentially, the coupling is given by g squared. <coughs> OK, and uh, all this is very important. Already, the fact that the fermions and the bosons have the same mass is a signature of supersymmetry. So if, if the minimum is supersymmetric, that's uh, something we'll have to see. At the end, the bosons and the fermions will have the same mass. Uh, but also, that the couplings between fermions and scalars is the same as the couplings among the scalars. So this implies. This is actually the source so, 
This is the source. of what people call miraculous. I, I don't know if that is well spelled. Is that correct? Yeah. Miraculous. It's generally a CU. A CU here. More or less, huh? No, it's, okay. <laughs> this, this OU, well, anyway. <laughs> That's all right, good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, cancellations. In supersymmetry, perturbation theory. Okay. <clears throat> In the sense that you have diagrams that uh, will be completely different in uh, non-supersymmetric theories. They, since they have the same coupling, they will they will they will can consider to to compare with each other, and they actually cancel. Uh, for instance, you have uh, imagine that this is a this is a phi field. So this is a g square coupling, and if you have the same. field, but now coupled to the psi, this coupling is G also, and this coupling is G. So if the couplings were arbitrary, these two diagrams will give you completely different things, and actually they are the source of, of some divergences in field theory. But when you have these two diagrams, and together with everything else that contributes to two external legs of a scalar boson, a scalar uh, fields, at the end that gives you something finite. They cancel each other. The fermion part, the fermion part cancels the the so the divergent part of this cancels the divergent part of that. So, and that is at the at the origin of the fact that people uh, uh, start to say, well, supersymmetric theories have much better quantum behavior than standard non-supersymmetric theories. So this. This divergences cancel each other. And, uh, and this is uh, the reason, precisely, if, you f if this field is a, is a Higgs field, so these are, say, corrections to the, to the Higgs mass, for instance, and then there, that's, that's a way of, of, of saying why supersymmetry um, Helps to solve the hierarchy problem. The hierarchy problem is that the Higgs mass can be moved very, very high, to very high values, and in this case, it's, it's, it's getting um, these cancellations help the Higgs mass to, to stay small. So that's something we will see in more detail uh, when we discuss the standard model. But this is the the, the basic idea that people had in the past that uh, all these cancellations in supersymmetry theory were helping to solve the hierarchy problem. Okay. <coughs> Yes. Uh, it, it is possible, but it's not true. Uh, it's not, it doesn't happen. Uh, in general, there are, uh, people had a hope at some point that uh, this this was happening in some cases, and as well, it may be that uh, when you couple to gravity, that would be the way to quantize gravity in a consistent manner. That, that, that you start cancelling loops. In, in supersymmetric uh, gravitational theories, and, 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 and that, that will be a way to, to have a, a real consistent theory of gravity based on supergravity. Uh, however, that didn't happen. When people did explicit calculations up to some order of perturbation theory, they got uh, uh, infinities. So uh, uh, still, it's not completely proven for n equals to eight supergravity yet. There's still people still doing some some some. Uh, Sorry? I thought there were divergences. I think, uh, but it's not, it's not completely clear if they, if they cannot cancel or not. They can be cancelled or not. People say up to a given loop, then you you will f you're not guaranteed that they, they will they will not be cancelled. And then there's this group, um, Dixon et al. and, and um, uh, I forgot the other guy, uh, Dunbar, I think, in, in, uh, and um, that uh, uh, is not 
the, the, uh, it's not clear that they will be there. So it's something they were having some hopes at some point that, that even those, the ones that people say, well, up to these loops, there's no reason why they should not be zero. And still people were saying even those may be zero, although nobody believes that that, that will be the case. So essentially, uh, uh, that, that's, that's essentially a, 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 an issue that is not under discussion any longer. So no, nobody hopes that uh, this will provide a good quantum theory of gravity, <coughs> any, any, any supersymmetric uh, uh, regionalization of gravity. So it has some nice properties, but, but uh, it cannot go all the way. And uh, you can see when you go to higher supersymmetries without gravity, then uh, the quantum behavior gets better. Diagram cancel, right? No. Are there any situations in which it can, like COVID theory, where, where the tree level is exact? Where the tree level is exact? Yeah. No, because uh, we will see that, that the tree level is exact uh, for the superpotential. The superpotential coupling, you can keep it. But anything coming from the Keller potential gets corrections. That's, 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 that's the solve of the problem. So, I mean, it's a generic case, but there are no special cases. Uh, not that I know. The simplest case is that, no. no. I mean, I don't know any funny case where this, the Keller potential uh, 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 will not. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, unless you go to n equals to four. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. If n equals to four, then, then, then of course, but then it's very close to n equals to one now. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so in that case, you can see n equals to four as a, as a particular case of n equals to one, and then that will get. Okay. So that, that was the, the case for. Um, for this West Sumino model, in general, we can go more general than this in the sense that we don't have to restrict to Keller potentials of this type. You can have non-renormalizable Keller potentials. There is nothing wrong with a non-renormalizable theory as, as long as it is seen as an effective field theory at, at a given energy. So, and we can have many, many scalar fields. So in general, I was going to say, the, the philosophy of that is, uh, I mean, if you're going to consider non normalizable potential, it's fine as long as you include all possible diagrams that, gauge, that obey the gauge symmetry. Because if you're going to think of it as an effective field theory, all the possible terms are going to be generated. You know, uh, infinite you terms. Include, right, if you're going to think of it as an effective field theory. Yes, but the thing that the, the, the good thing about effective field theories is that you can say, I trust this up to this cutoff scale. Sure, sure. And then after that, so you, start, you, you, you can trust all your calculations and so on, and then you say, beyond that, you don't trust it. But before that, you can do the calculations and, and get information out of it. So in that sense, it's good. Uh, uh, it's good to have a, 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 a non-normalizable field theory, as long as it's ineffective. So, so I mean, the, the all relevant operations. All relevant operations have to be considered. But of course, since you have an expansion in one over the cutoff, yeah. so you can, you can control your approximation. And that, and that, and that, is, that, is, the, that is the next. Good. <clears throat> okay, so in general, we will have k as a function of, uh, say, phi i and phi I j dagger, and w as an, an, any, any function of uh, scalar fields. <clears throat> and when you write this in components, it, it will be very easy in the same way that remember how I told you uh, when we derived this uh, Lagrangian the other day, in components we started with the W and then expanded around phi, capital phi equals to little phi, and then did a Taylor expansion. And that's, that's how we got first derivative and second derivative because they were the, the Taylor expansion uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, in, the, in the expression. And at some point we stop here because they, you'd, otherwise, um, for higher derivatives, you will get uh, too many thetas, and that will be zero. Okay, so that, that, that was what we did in, in W. Remember that because this is important. Who doesn't remember? Good. So you have better memory than I have. So <clears throat> it's good to ask the question that way because if I ask the question, who, do, who does remember? Nobody will react in there. So <laughs> but, uh, anyway, <clears throat> yes, I have found. Grads is also the case. I'm teaching on the grads, and it is too cool to raise the hand. So, so you, when you ask something, nobody. <laughs> yeah, so, you raise the hand is not very cool. So, anyway. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> anyway. So, <clears throat> so in general, you have k 
and W like that. So then you say, well, how can I write the, the Lagrangian in components when you have a general K and a general W? So I do it for W. I essentially did it because I, I did it the other time without writing the, the, the W as a cubic, but I just expanded first derivative, second derivative, and so on. For K, it will be the same. So you span, span around phi i equals to phi i. And, and read. So, for remember, <clears throat> for the Keter potential, the case what we consider here was phi dagger phi, and phi dagger phi was giving us the kinetic terms. Okay. So now, for a general K, we take the term in the expansion that will be will give us a, a quadratic piece like phi dagger phi, and the coefficient of that will be the second derivative of the Keter potential. So this gives in components. You will have, for instance, the kinetic term. It will be d2k by d phi i d phi star j times d mu phi i d mu phi star j. OK, so <clears throat> essentially, uh, this is what you get, and you get this again by, by this is from uh, it's essentially the, uh, the Taylor expansion. Okay, as I told you, around phi equals to phi. So this is very nice. Now you have the kinetic terms are not the standard kinetic terms, which were one, but now you have a non-standard kinetic term. This is usually written as a and, and if you look at this, it, it gives us, it tells you something. Have you seen something like that before? Metric. Very good, very good. So this object behaves as a metric in the space where the coordinates are the phi's. Okay. Sorry? Yes. This index is j, yes. And this thing's a star. Yeah. Yes. Very good. So what about the linear term? Linear term doesn't appear. Uh, in the uh, in the in, in what in, in the in the defines. No, but I mean when you were expanding the Taylor series. Yes. A constant term, a linear term, and then a quadratic term. You got the quadratic term. Yes. What happened to the linear term? Uh, it goes away essentially. You, 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 you don't get because remember you have to have is the, the d term of k. So you have to see what what thing co contributes to the d term. Yes. So then that doesn't. Exactly. The yes, <clears throat> Good question. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, this is important. So then Kij is a metric in the space of, uh, of uh, a space with coordinates Being the phi i's or the phi i's. Okay, so and uh, this is very interesting because then you have a whole geometrical meaning out of the supersymmetric action, actions. That in the sense you have a, this is what is called a nonlinear sigma model. If you have seen, I've heard that word before. So it's a, in the sense that the kinetic term, the coefficient of that is not a constant, but it's a, any, it's a function of the scalar fields also. And and this has the structure of a metric. You may have seen that also in string theory. You have uh, the string coordinates times that, that would, they become the metric of a space time. So the phi's are, are uh, genuine uh, coordinates in a space. And the space will be a complex space, because the phi's are complex. And actually, you, you, you can actually uh, 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 Define and work in, in, in complex spaces, but be, be, it's not only the, the space is not only complex, but it's called a Keller manifold. So the space 
of the white eyes is a, well, it's complex, of course. Keller manifold. Okay, what does Keller means? Keller um, <clears throat> was a very lucky person. He got his name attached to something, so that's good. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, Keller manifold means that it's a manifold that uh, such that the metric is given in terms of a potential of, of, a, of, a, of a function k. So you're giving any metric cannot be given, cannot be written as a second derivative of something. So for Keller manifolds, that's that's a property. So a Keller manifold is a property where the metric g i j star, which I now I'm calling I'm identifying with k i j star, is equal to the second derivative of k. Okay, so that means that the whole structure of the manifold, the whole metric structure of the manifold, is given not by by a tensor itself, but it's given by a scalar function. So you give a scalar function, and out of that you build the metric. So that that is a very particular kind of manifolds, and 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 those are called uh, Keller manifolds. And uh, also, uh, they had also good taste in his family because Keller. That's what it's called. K is called K because of Keller. But it's also giving you, you know that k is giving you the, here, it's giving you the kinetic terms. So the k works very well. Okay? So, so you always remember that all the kinetic terms come from the killer uh, potential. Good. And, and I, I will not write the full uh, uh, Lagrangian for you, but the whole Lagrangian can be written in terms of this uh, um, metric. So then you, you will get the Christoffel symbols appearing, even the, the curvature manifold is the coupling of the four fermions. So you have psi, 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 and the coefficient of this four fermions is the curvature, for instance. So it's, it's, it's a very geometrical uh, structure within the, um, the supersymmetric Lagrangian. Okay, so I finished this part with chiral superfields. Now I will do uh, vector superfields. So again, we want. Couplings of the phi i's, v's, and the w alphas. So for that, let's recall what we do in non-supersymmetric theories. In non-supersymmetric theory, we have a kinetic terms, for instance, like this. And there was a symmetry phi going to <coughs> e to the i q phi, or q is a charge. And then we say, well, uh, if we want, I'm sorry, times alpha, alpha q phi. And uh, for if, uh, if alpha is written as a function of x, then this is no longer symmetric, so you have to introduce d mu phi, which is equal to d mu phi minus i q a mu phi, where a mu then transforms as a, a mu plus d mu alpha. And this is the way that we know the couplings, then, then the Lagrangian will be d mu phi, d mu phi star, plus other terms. And then this is the way that the gauge fields couple 
to, to the scalar, for instance. That's something we have seen before. So that was that is a step uh, one. Step uh, one, just introduce the gauge field such that uh, you have the invariant kinetic terms. And then after that, the step two, after that, you, you will add a kinetic term for A. And that's given by F mu nu, F mu nu, with some coupling like that, OK? Where F mu nu is a, is a d, d mu nu. OK, so <clears throat> we're going to follow these same steps now for supersymmetry. Let's start with the simplest case. So k equals uh, phi dagger phi. Phi dagger phi. And then we want to see how it um, <coughs> it transforms. Uh, this term will not be invariant. Under the transformation, say, phi going to e to the i lambda, e to the i, say, q lambda, phi. Because then, then, for this information, phi dagger phi goes to <coughs> phi dagger e to the i. Let me just com be completely <coughs> q. Yes, q lambda minus lambda dagger phi. Because if phi goes to this, phi dagger will go to phi dagger e to the minus iq lambda dagger, and then we get uh, this transformation. So in general, if lambda is a superfield, this will not be invariant. So what is the solution for that? Introduce the same way here. Here we introduce a gauge field such that it makes the kinetic term invariant. So now we have to introduce a vector superfield such that it makes this term invariant. So then. The step A is introduce V. <coughs> and uh, such that instead of phi dagger phi, K will be written as phi dagger e to the i QV times phi. <coughs> And uh, then V transforms V, let's be sure, minus I lambda minus lambda dagger. OK, so you can check if we add here. You transform now V by this shift. This shift will cancel this thing, and that will make this thing invariant. And that was precisely the, what we defined before. Remember when, when we talk about generalized gauge transformation? This is a generalized Yes? Can you explain what is 
lambda? Lambda has superfield, yes. So lambda has superfield. Sorry? General superfield. Uh, chiral superfield. So lambda is chiral superfield. Uh, I didn't say, I'm sorry. Yes. Lambda, chiral. Yes, sorry about that. Yes. So, <clears throat> so th then this, this transformation, when you go phi, go it, it's IQ lambda phi, with la uh, lambda being, being a, a chiral superfield, phi dagger phi is non invariant. And then uh, you make it invariant by introducing the vector superfield such that V transforms in this way. And precisely the transformation of V and phi, this is what I had introduced for you as, as the generalized gauge transformation for a scalar. Uh, for chiral superfields. Remember that I couldn't have written here just a standard function, a, a standard phase, because this will not be then a superfield itself. So it has to be a chiral superfield so that the product will be chiral. Yes, thank you for the question. Okay, so this is exactly a step A as before, so that, that tells you that now the coupling, the kinetic term, uh, instead of just having the, the, the the, the thing that is playing the role of covariant derivatives in non-supersymmetric theory is introducing this coupling of phi to the superfield V. And of course then, that will tell us how the chiral superfields couple to vector superfields. Okay? So that tells us how uh, chiral superfields and vector superfields couple, in the same way that the, that the covariant derivatives was telling us how the scalar fields couple to vector fields. Okay, so that's step A. Then B, we have to add a kinetic term for V. <clears throat> and since we know that uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, field strain superfield W alpha, so then the L kinetic will be just proportional to W alpha, W alpha. Since W is chiral, this is also chiral. And to make that into a Lagrangian, there has to be taken the, the F term of that. OK. So <clears throat> OK, so it's essentially, this is going to generalize the F mu nu, F mu nu piece that we have, and times some coupling here. Uh, so in general, times the coupling, I would call the coupling tau. <coughs> okay. If if we want this to be renormalizable, this tau should be just a constant. In the same way that if we want this to be renormalizable, this has to be a constant. In more general case, this can be a function of. Uh, of phi. General so a function of the scalar fields times W alpha W alpha. F term. And of course, to this we have to add a Fermi-Chain conjugate to make the Lagrangian real. And please do not make a mistake that, that uh, it is unfortunate in this field that there are two important things called W. W is the superpotential, and W alpha is this field strength superfield. So they're completely unrelated things. So please keep that in mind. But this is the standard notation, so we cannot change. So W alpha. W alpha is field strength superfield. Something that I defined a couple of uh, lectures ago in terms of derivatives, covariant derivatives of, of, uh, of V. You remember there was D, D, D acting on V. <coughs> okay. And, and as I told you, this W alpha, the reason that it existed, it, that, that we introduced it, is because it had as one of the components F mu nu. And then the W alpha, W alpha, will have as one of the components F mu nu, F mu nu. And this function, F, has to be a function only of phi, not of phi dagger, because uh, <coughs> otherwise it will not be chiral. 
and we want the whole thing to be an F term. So, uh, uh, and this is an arbitrary function, and it's called, for lack of a better name, it's called, called the gauge kinetic function. Any questions? Good. So, in principle, well, I had followed the same steps that I did for the non-supersymmetric case. Just introduce a mu to give you the coupling between scalars and, and firm and, and gauge fields, then add a kinetic term. However, in supersymmetry, there is something else that we have to we can add. That is 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 is, is uh, um, that is, is allowed by all the, 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 the symmetries of the theory. And uh, so there is a, there's a new term in the Lagrangian that we can add. It's not only the couplings of phi, of, uh, of phi and V through this modified carrier potential, and also the couplings of um, phi and, and, uh, and F mu through this uh, kinetic term. But uh, there's a third thing we, ha we have to add, and I hope I have enough room in this blackboard to to, to write it. <coughs> so this is a, this LFI, which is a, called a, FI means Faye Iliopoulos, is but the name of the two people who introduced that. And this term is a, <coughs> is something you can add to the Lagrangian that is, is, is allowed by, super, by supersymmetry. There will be a constant that I call this uh, psi. Then I can have this v, which is the, 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 the vector superfield v, and take the d term. Okay. So v is a vector superfield. It's invariant on the, on the, on the, <coughs> on the, uh, the gauge transformations. If you take the d term of it, it's an invariant thing on the gauge transformations. And, uh, and they multiply by a constant, and that's it. Okay, so this is the Fajelio plus term. So, okay. So it's a constant times the, the d term of v because v v is a, is a is a vector superfield. So the d term transforms as a total derivative. So there is nothing. Uh, against that. Notice that this will be true only if the uh, corresponding gauge theory is a uh, U1. If you have a non-abelian gauge theory, then the, the D term of the vector superfield will not be invariant because it will transform uh, under, under the, trans the non-abelian transformations. So then uh, this is only, only there for For you, one gauge transform gauge theories. Okay. So now we can put everything together. We have the the all the ingredients to have uh, what is called super QED. In sense, it's quantum electrodynamics, uh, supersymmetric, in the sense that we have the coupling of a, of a matter to to the uh, gauge theory. <coughs> So, <clears throat> so the Lagrangian will be then. Um, so, if you will write the renormalizable, just to. Will be phi dagger into the Q V phi D term. 
then in principle we have, I, I'm writing phi, I'm not writing sub indices, but we can consider many phi's. So you can have a superpotential also. However, this superpotential has to be such that it's invariant under the corresponding uh, transformation. So it's, it's, it's a strong constraint for the super, for superpotential. So if you have only one field and you uh, transform by a phase, any power of that will not be invariant. But you have several, super, several superfields with opposite charges, then you can make invariant uh, couplings, self-couplings. Excuse me? Is it key to the QB or is it key to the IQB? I think it's QB. It's QB. Because they, the V has an I in the transformation. Oh, oh, no, 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 sorry. No, this is okay. Yes, sorry. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry about that. Yes. <clears throat> yes, so plus. So this is the total Lagrangian. So <clears throat> in principle, this is defined, say, super quantum electrodynamics. OK. As I told you, if there is only one field phi, they, they will not be super potential invariant. But if there are several, you can have. Couplings between opposite charges, and uh, so we have that. And so, what is it that we have to do now? We have to write this in components. But uh, I'm running out of time, so I will do it next time. So, so we start from here and write the Lagrangian in components, and then you will see how super QED will emerge. Okay, thank you.